Just a minute here, do a couple quick retweets. Uh, make sure all of this is going out before we uh, kick off into the show. Happy Microsoft Build Day. We're going to be talking about some of the stuff coming out of uh, Build announcements uh, right quick. I can get rid of this streaming right here. And we are live. Welcome to another Monday morning tech chat. You know, a lot of uh, news headlines get pumped up. We uh, we have that initial surge of coverage on things, and then uh, we sit through the weekend, and then we expect fresh news on our Monday morning plates. This is uh, the right way to get our week started off with some tech conversations, tech chat. So I hope you guys are going to be uh, joining me for that. And uh doing some really fun stuff. I've got my live chat up right now. So yes, we are going to go through uh, a number of stories. Uh, Renato Laporte just jumping in. Good evening. Just had a cheese hot dog at Shake Shack ready to go. (laughs) I love it. I love it. It's my Monday morning, but the rest of the world is already days ahead of me. Um, yeah, some really good times. Just uh, wanted to uh, jump in and uh, here, let me get this out of the way right here. I, I want to kick off immediately, uh, start talking about a couple little stories. I'm going to try and keep this podcast, this episode, under two hours. How about that? <laughs> I've been rambling on a lot, going really long on a, on a bunch of these shows, and uh, it's that's probably not the best look. So, uh uh, James Vincent, hey, hey, holiday, no work. Woohoo! All right, James. Well, I appreciate you spending time with me on your holiday. We're going to be talking about from Ari uh, Kas- Kaswara. I've just butchered your name. I apologize. Hi there, Juan. Hi, Ari. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about some build news towards the end of the show because I think we'll actually have some headlines to share there. We're going to be talking about a couple businesses going out of business. We're going to be sharing my reaction to the reactions on the LG G7. Uh, some Facebook news, some Tesla news, some net neutrality, some big news coming out of net neutrality. So we're going to have a lot to talk about. But I'm going to try and blitz this real quick. Again, we're, we're aiming for not a two-hour podcast, and I'm going to have a fun little game throughout the broadcast to see if anyone picks up on the thing what I'll do for people streaming the live video. For those of you who are going to catch the audio podcast, I'm going to have a completely different game. There's two different games. Actually, two very similar games, but I'll be I'll, I'll be sharing these games in very different ways, or I'll be playing these games in very different ways. That, that's enough rambling. And uh, Shuresh, hi from Toronto. Mark Z, hey, what's up? Fat Produce, greetings. I'm back from the boonies. <laughs> I love it. And Tech Time, what's up? All right, so let's let's jump in. This is uh, this is this first piece of news. Um, actually, I'm gonna run these two stories together. Nokia selling its health business back to the former owner. I was irrationally excited. Oh, sorry. This uh, this story by way of Engadget. I was irrationally excited when Nokia. Uh, bought out Withings. Uh, Withings makes a ton of really cool health and fitness gear. I always wanted to play with one of these Withings uh, smartwatches, these fitness tracking watches, just really clean, elegant design. I ended up getting a Skagen, which is fairly similar, actually, in terms of how it tracks some of that data and it, you know, just a simple analog watch face. Um, but I also had the the crazy Withings thermometer, it's a Wi-Fi enabled health tracking thermometer. So if you're taking your temperature on the regular, um, you can uh, you can sort and organize that data. But it looks like uh, you can't sell health and fitness gear uh, anymore unless your company is Apple and you sell the Apple Watch. It, like everyone's getting hammered right now. Uh, Fitbit has been posting uh, quarter after quarter after quarter. I believe four quarters of consistent losses. Uh, we haven't seen Android Wear picking up any of the slack. Even with Wear OS, uh, this is one of my major complaints is Wear OS is focused on smart watches. But what about all the other things we could wear for fitness and health tracking, for you know just body sensors in general? We haven't seen any other company taking that kind of, um, taking that kind of initiative to build some kind of relationship with consumers. And, and we can't rely on, on sort of a distant, you know, uh, second or third place. But so many other manufacturers that could be moving into this space and looking at health and fitness gear. <laughs> I think one of the things that's, that's disappointing me the most about... Um, one of the things that's disappointing me... The, 
I'm sorry, I just got this from Fat Produce. I need a tooth filling with a built-in pedometer. <laughs> that's hilarious. Sorry, yeah, that's just really funny. And this is what's confusing. Is is uh, this is from Renato Laporte? Wouldn't it be smarter for Nokia to handle it, to hand it to uh, HMD? Um, HMD is the parent company which is licensing the Nokia name to build smartphones. But there is still a Nokia which makes like super high end. 3D, uh, 360 degree cameras. And so this is where all of these different parts and pieces are moving in ways where there doesn't seem to be a lot of synergy on that Nokia brand name for consumer facing gear. And it looks like Nokia proper is going to be walking away from consumers entirely, whereas HMD will license the Nokia name for smartphones and some smartphone accessories. And it's really unclear where exactly. I mean, again, I, I, I should probably be digging into their their shareholder announcements more ruthlessly with that fine tooth comb to try and pick out the tiny little details, which would explain these relationships a little bit better. But I'm I'm kind of lazy, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but this is this is what's what's kind of curious. Now they're selling it back to the original owner, and this Withings was a very tiny boutiquey company, something on the order of maybe two to three hundred employees in France. Um, but phenomenal design, really interesting take on lifestyle gadgets and ways and ways to connect data to uh, some of our lifestyle activities. Like I said, a smart thermometer that hooks up to your Wi-Fi is not something I need, but is kind of cool. But then you mix into that, they would sell smart scales, smart watches, uh, different types of home web security cameras way before. Uh, they were in this market way before we had all of these different IoT, Wi-Fi enabled, uh, you know, doorbell cameras and things like that. Withings was way ahead of the curve. Um, from Harari, it's pronounced Nokia, not Nokia. <laughs> helpful, but not too helpful. So, uh, yeah, this is this is one of those things. I'll I'll be, I'll be really interested to see if we see the fast turnaround. We when Nokia bought Withings, we saw them flip the name really quickly, so that Withings was going to be running their lifestyle tech department, but it all had the Nokia name on it. Now, are we going to see that return to Withings as quickly, or are they going to take some time out of the market? Are we going to see them try and reassess where they are strong, where they are competitive? And then what does this mean? I'm curious to see your thoughts. How do we build ecosystems for people to trust gadgets that track our health and do that outside the realm of Apple and iOS? You know, there's a huge underserved market of people on Android devices, of people who aren't really in the iOS Android debate. Maybe they have a smartphone, but they're not necessarily tied to an ecosystem. How do we, man how, how do we move the needle? How do we build faith in a brand? How do we build consumer confidence in a brand? and get them to execute on really cool tech, really cool gear. Share your thoughts, just what you think Withings can do to, to continue making really cool stuff. I, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want really cool gear. And some of those steel smartwatches, some of the HR smartwatches, some of those things were really clean, really exciting. And then we never heard about them. They, they just sort of disappeared. It was like we, we rebadged them. We put a new brand name on them. And then what? And we don't know. So anyway, I'll be curious to hear your thoughts if you guys have uh, any ideas on what these different companies can do and how we can flesh out this sort of... Because I think there are so many holes here. There are so many um, missed opportunities from some of these manufacturers. Instead of just trying to copy what a few successful players have done, looking at where there are holes in the market. Like I keep looking at polar chest straps and wondering why there isn't a more gadgety version of that that connects with our our smartphones or smartwatches or plays in like Samsung's ecosystem or plays in Apple's ecosystem or offers some kind of solution that wasn't there before. You know, again, sensors in shoes. Why have a pedometer on your wrist? That's actually really dumb. <laughs> That's a dumb place to put the the sensor that tracks your footfalls not on your foot. So why not go back to what Nike was doing way back in the day with shoe sensors? I digress. Anyway, Renato Laporte, they should all use Google Fit if Google Fit didn't suck. When the hardware is attached to a closed ecosystem, it won't work. Again, 
unless you're Apple, that's the thing that shocks me is people are willing to sort of extend this goodwill. You know, like Apple Watch, first generation, not very good. But, oh, Apple will make it better. No other company gets that that consideration. Every other company, we're going to be talking about LG in just a little bit. Every other company releases a product and it just gets pooped on by a majority of people unless you're Apple or Samsung. And then it's like up to the company to justify its own existence or anyone who's a fan of the company has to like defend that company. And that's a major problem right now when we're so cynical about new players, not even new players, established players in the market too. Um, from, uh, from Ruari, I've mispronounced your name. Nokia does, oh, whoops, live chat moving faster than I can read. Nokia doesn't have the same sparkle it used to have. My first Nokia was a 3310, had the 7650 camera phone and other mad Nokia devices like the 3650 or the N-Gage. Nokia just feels boring and safe now. And I agree, well, for consumer facing stuff. Again, they're back end, corporate, um, high end production gear, really exciting stuff. None of it seems to be filtering down into our hands. I'm doing grabby hands. Give me that stuff. Fat Produce, I wonder if any hybrid watches could be made with winding mechanics to run no batteries. I have no idea how you would do that with Bluetooth. I think you would always need some kind of power source, even for low power Bluetooth. But that's why I'm always so excited to show off my Skagen. I've gone through one battery change in over a year and a half since I've gotten it. Um, yeah, I've had it for a while. And, uh, yeah, it takes a watch battery, so that's a bummer. you got to throw out a watch battery, but it lasts for a stinking long time, um, you, and you never charge it. It's just a watch battery. That low-power Bluetooth works a trick. Renata Laporte, if I had a simple Fitbit and a Samsung smartwatch, they won't play together. I need to be balancing my attention between two ecosystems. And if you're talking Samsung, then you might be balancing between Fitbit software, Samsung software, Google software, two different hardware platforms, and none of it really talks well together. Again, it's that XKCD comic I'm going to keep referencing. Someone saw an opportunity in that there were a ton of different standards to get something done, and then they created a new standard that would be better, and now there's just more, more noise in the in the issue uh from and also from renato oh you're talking about the g7 so i'm gonna i'm gonna come back to your comment or i'm not gonna come back to your comment there's just way too much happening in the live chat for me to get through it um uh, let me sift up there was another uh, another quick uh announcement here from a company this comes by way of the la times this is a company i didn't even know about and i'm a bag whore um i would have been all about this company, if I'd even known about it, this is LA Times, maker of smart luggage goes out of business after airlines ban bags with built-in batteries. So this company is Blue Smart. Apparently they made a whole bunch of really smart, cool looking uh, luggage with built-in batteries and GPS connectivity so that owners could track their bags uh, based on that power source and data connectivity. Um, but uh, but uh, again, because of the recent changes in how and where you can store uh, lithium ion batteries in airplanes, uh, this is the attention following the Note 7 debacle. Um, a lot of airlines are now saying you can't keep batteries down in the hold of an airplane uh, and you can only keep batteries of certain sizes. So if you had a big old honking battery in a suitcase, you would think, OK, well, that's pretty safe. Um the, the, the issue being now, uh, they're, they're preventing that because you don't want uh, a battery fire happening in a part of the airplane where people can't get to it easily while the airplane is actually in the sky. So now apparently this company is going out of business. They're going to be selling off their IP and their designs to Travel Pro. another company I'm not super familiar with in terms of baggage and luggage, but it's just a major bummer. You know, this is totally something I would have played with. And then I would have gotten really upset if I couldn't have flown with it. Um, one of the things that they're talking about in this article was apparently their solution for building batteries into the luggage was tr to try and guard and protect the battery so well that it made removing the battery from the luggage really difficult. Multiple screws, cable connectors, things like that, that, that were difficult to uh, pop the battery out. One of the only bags I had that had a built-in battery, it was a really simple just click. There was one plastic tab and just like some terminals that would detach and you were fine. So if it were something like that, it, maybe they would have had an easier time 
working with customers or coming up with new designs that could satisfy some of these new airline regulations. But uh, it's uh, it, it's really a shame, you know. I'm 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 retroactively or no, am I retroactively? I don't know what the word I want to use there. I'm sad. <laughs> I'm disappointed that I never got to play with this gear because this totally would have been right up my alley, especially for the number of times I've had luggage lost. And you're like, I want to know where my luggage is. And now I don't have that option to attach GPS tracking to my luggage. Uh, from Renata Laporte. Who'd have thunk, as far as I know, since a few accidents way before the whole note debacle, carrying batteries in the cargo area is only allowed in special fire-resistant containers. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, really, I'm pointing to the Note 7 is because that's when I started paying attention to battery restrictions. And at the same time, I was starting to review some really big batteries. So uh, what is I have the charge tech. It's the one with two uh, actual electrical socket um, ports on the front, and it can power small appliances or TVs out in the field. And I, I was really disappointed to find out after I'd already started reviewing it that that's not a battery I could fly with. I got it because I wanted to have something that could power my really intense power sucking gaming laptop and I couldn't really travel with it. But it still worked out a trick when I use it on like little uh, little film shoots or little production gigs. You know, you can power lights off that thing. You can you can keep multiple cameras running or keeping batteries charged. I mean, it, it works a trick for all of that. It's just a bummer that I couldn't, you know, put it on an airplane where a lot of my gigs require me to get on airplanes. So that's a bummer. True story. Anyway. Uh, I don't know. What are you guys using for your for your mobile power? Uh, I, I, it seems like the fad of building batteries into backpacks and into bags has kind of waned since there are so many good um, mobile power packs out there. Is anyone still looking to shop a bag with a battery built specifically for a hold or a container in there? Or are you just running USB cables like I am from one pocket of the bag to another pocket of the bag, even though that looks a little messy? It's it's not proprietary or built into the bag. Let me know. Uh, I, I, I'd be curious to see what um, what you guys think about that. From Suresh, uh, not on topic. What happened to Juan's real audio and real camera reviews? I know he also works for Newegg, but they just disappeared. I will cover that at the end of the episode because I have some news about that. From Matt Josephson, where is there an LG? Oh, sorry. Matt Josephson is replying to someone else. Again, there was a whole conversation about LG, which we're going to be talking about next. Um... From Ruari, I tried bringing my car battery from Ireland to the UK on Aer Lingus. They told me to feck off. I would have too. Car battery. No, man. Not okay. <laughs> from Renato, last comment on this. To be honest, with everyone flying with a shady portable power bank, when something happens, it won't take long for companies to put more restrictions. So, yeah, that's that's definitely true. Um it's uh, it's one of those things. It's it's kind of like a. My brain is failing me on these types of metaphorical style comparison things because it's not. Anyway, so what what I was gonna say is it's one of those things like when the news starts examining something, you see more stories about it, so it feels like there's more problems there than there really are, or. Um, you know, when, when we're looking at some of the numbers behind different health conditions, we're seeing those spike, but we're seeing them spike after diagnosticians have better tools to diagnose those problems. So were there really more people exhibiting that problem or was there just better examination of it? For the batteries, we're seeing, you know, more people flying with with battery packs. You know, people are tired of trying to look for electrical sockets in airports and sitting on the floor, so they're going to pack a little battery. And like my parents have 3 or 4 different sized battery packs for day trips, for, you know, traveling internationally. I mean, they they're on board. My parents are pretty tech savvy. I maybe uh, they're just ahead of the curve. But um with so so many more people, we would imagine that a ton of those battery packs are probably crap. And that we'll likely see more issues, but I haven't seen any significant uptick in problems so far. Knock on wood, fingers crossed, let's just keep it that way. 
Um, from Gabaletta, uh, excuse me while I sort of wipe my nose there. From Gabaletta, to me, backpacks with built-in batteries in them is a nice idea, but impractical at the end. Just buy a portable power bank and a bag separately. Um, I would uh, be inclined to agree, especially because I am a major whore. I'm going to be trying to put out a bag review on a new manufacturer, a new company that I just found. Uh, and I, I, I love, I love, I have an unhealthy relationship with collecting bags and camera slings specifically. If you make a crossbody sling with, I don't know, three to five Velcro adjustable pockets, then I will desperately try to get your bag. I, I adore them. I love them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have another review on that out. But one of the reasons why I like that bag configuration is that it's really easy to put in a hunkin' large battery pack into a side pocket and then run cables through a camera bag to make sure that I can charge whatever I need to charge out in the field. And then also becomes really practical if I'm using one piece of equipment out of that bag, I can keep other pieces of equipment fully charged at the same time. So I am, I'm a huge fan of that configuration. Um... Um, from Matt Josephson, I had a tilt bag, still love it. Uh, it was submerged by accident, so the battery was shot. I replaced it with an anchor power pack. That's actually another good point, too, is bags go out into weather and into um, into conditions, like especially if you like good field gear like I do. This has taken me back all the way to my Boy Scout days. I would I would be less trustful of just a regular consumer backpack with a battery in it than I would be a hardcore field pack, camera bag, something that was designed to, you know, really tackle some inclement weather and, and some rough conditions. Um, but also for Matt Joseph Josephson, I like the ease of routing cables on a bag made for it. So that's a good point, too. I don't have many bags that actually have good cable management outside of, like, your headphone jack. So that's that's kind of a bummer. And from Blue Malicious, I think we found Juan's bag fetish. I don't I don't know where you've been. I I've been sharing this for a while on my own channel. I I own that. I'm a bag whore. <laughs> it's not you know, like not even a fetish. I just have that that closet behind me. You see that mirror door back there? Over full with bags. Um, I did a I did a travel tech prep video. I did a, I was trying to do like a full series on them. I need to get back to those. I think I have two more shot. And I just haven't edited them. Uh, but I did one on bags and just different types of bag configurations. And you can see half of my bag collection in that video. And it's more bags than the field of view of my camera can properly contain. So. Moving right along <laughs> from Fat Produce One, you are with bags like I am with hats. And it's not like I'm not into hats too. Let's get into the LG G7. I do not have one. I'm talking to the folks at LG about maybe trying to get a loaner, do some review, uh, some coverage on it. But I really want to talk about not just the phone, but sort of the reactions to the phone that I've been seeing so far. And, and just how, um, I don't know, the word I want to use is something like dispassionate. A lot of the reviewers are new smartphone, LG, major manufacturer. We were in this really bizarre, will they, won't they release a phone at the beginning of the year. Uh, LG is the global parent company really trying to manage expectations on a new phone. Phone performance hadn't been very high at LG uh, the, the department wasn't performing like LG wanted them to. Uh, Shakeups with management, with the CEO, um, really trying to get a toehold on what would make LG more competitive in the smartphone market, and a ton of conversation about them just skipping the G7. Uh, ultimately, what we got was the LG G7. Thank you. Um, yeah, I hate that name. I'm just going to call it the G7. I think most tech reviewers are 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 agreed there. This is this is not um this is this is not a good name for a phone and it's branding on AI stuff that I don't think any it's really going to resonate with anyone. Um but this is this is what I find interesting. We are in Another refinement year. So I'm on the video, I'm showing the LG page for the G7. Uh, we know it's going to come with a whole ton of camera features that have been well established since the V10. Uh, we're seeing discussion on the new uh, speaker 
uh, there's going to be a new chamber for the speaker, which LG claims is going to make uh, is going to make audio from the phone louder and clearer. Uh, they, they have a pretty good handle on audio tech, and we, we are talking about another quad DAC phone. So this will be another top tier performer for people who enjoy audio on their phone. And uh, one of the things that I think is really exciting isn't the shape of the screen. I'm not super excited about a taller, skinnier display. The, the full um, aspect ratio on this display is 19.5. Um, so, so that's really tall and skinny, but one of the reasons why we're, we're getting to claim that is, again, because this phone has that little notch at the top, which really just blends into the notification shade um, so you can dock your speaker and your selfie camera. Uh, what What's exciting to me about the display isn't the shape of it, but what they're talking about for the display tech. So this display is going to have a quad sub-pixel arrangement. So to, to, to get into the weeds just a little bit, to geek out just a little bit, you guys are familiar with display tech, RGB, red, green, blue, subpixels that make up all of the colors. You boost up red and blue a little bit, you get purple, you boost, boost up all of these colors together, you get white. So what LG is doing here is instead of doing an AMOLED which uses a staggered subpixel arrangement, um, the subpixel arrangement on a Galaxy phone or the V30, which also uses an AMOLED display, is what we call pen tile. So the RGB pixels are actually spread out in a different configuration. So each pixel does not get a full R, G, and B subpixel. They're sort of, they're, they're sort of uh, spaced and staggered so that you can make the manufacturing on that a little less expensive, especially in how uh, these, these AMOLED displays are sort of printed out. So for the G7, to maximize brightness, there will be a white subpixel in addition to R, G, and B. So that should make uh, the display slightly sharper, slightly crisper, and much easier to read when outside in bright conditions. Those are benefits. Those are exciting things for me to, for me to talk about. So then you say, well, this is a phone that has top-notch audio. There is no other competitor on the planet that can compete with the headphone jack on V-series phones, and the G7 is supposedly getting the same hardware as the V. Uh, there is no other device which is doing this sort of quad-pixel arrangement in the same way. So this is an exciting talking point, kind of like the Razer phone, having a super-fast refresh rate. That's a cool uh, benefit to have. And then just this is a refinement year. So we're we're cleaning up the look of other phones. Like I still have my G6. I still love the look and shape and feel of the G6. So they're going to make it a little thinner, make it a little sleeker, uh, clean up the forehead and chin bezels, all these things that consumers say they care about. So what kind of response do we see for the G7 as compared to what we saw with, say, the Galaxy S9? The Galaxy S9 got this this big goodwill push camera reimagined. Uh, it's the most amazing camera experience. Look, they finally fixed the fingerprint sensor location. OMG, this phone is great. And then after a while using it, the buzz kind of died down and people were a little bit more candid with the Galaxy S9 being a very good phone, top one of the top performers of the year, but it's... It's an iterative phone. I, I, I don't really think we've seen something exciting fresh from Samsung since the Galaxy S6. Every year from the Galaxy S6 has just been, let's fix this and let's refine that. Let's fix this and let's refine that. And the Galaxy S8 represented, oh, we're going we're gonna to change the screen aspect ratio. Exciting because it looked a little different, but from Galaxy S8 to Galaxy S9, I don't really see it, guys. I don't see where that was an exciting push. So I want to celebrate Samsung that they, they cleaned up and refined the few little gripes that I had with the Galaxy S9. But I'm not going to bend over backwards and start doing somersaults and cartwheels because a new Samsung came out. The flip side of that, it's really easy to pick on LG. So look at the tone of a lot of the videos coming out, these first hands-on, like... 
I don't know. I just don't know that LG's doing enough. I want them to do more. I want to, I want to see more. I don't see why you would buy this phone over a Samsung. And we even had, um, I, I'm, he's a really good friend of mine, and, and I love him to death. But it was funny listening to Nick Gray on um, Mobile Traveler on, uh, on the Pocket Now podcast. We had him on last week for the Pocket Now podcast. And he was even kind of going along the same thing. Like, I just don't see where this would be different or why you would go with this over a Galaxy. And you're like, well, you know, what if you care about camera features? And you're like, oh, yeah, well, this and that. And I love the wide-angle shooter on LG cameras. Like, okay, well, that would be one reason why you would get a G7. Well, I just don't know, but they're not doing enough. I just don't see where they're doing this or they're doing that. Like, well, what about the display? The display has this one benefit, quad pixel, you know, white pixel. It's going to be brighter. Okay, yeah. But, but I just don't see where it's enough. And like, okay, well, what about the headphone jack? That's a differentiator. Well, but Samsung's just so far ahead. They're just so way far ahead in the marketplace. I don't see why anyone would buy an LG over a Samsung because, like, a, a Samsung is, like, you know, 10 steps ahead and generations. And you're like, well, that's not entirely true, but okay, I guess, maybe. So I'm going to put the G7, uh, notch and all, because I freaking hate notches, um, I'm going to put the G7 in the same bucket. I am not terrifically, ridiculously excited over how much I liked the G6, but this looks like it's clear refinement over where we were last year. First of all, LG just gets props for using the current chipset. It was a major, major geek issue with the G6 is that they were so rushing so hard to get the G6 out that they had to use the, the chipset from the year before. So, you know, you didn't get your Qualcomm 835 in the LG G6. You got the Qualcomm 821. Well, they fixed that on the G7. Now you have the current, this is this year's chipset. Pricing looks like it's going to be in line. We don't know because LG is terrible at launching phones. They never have that, those kinds of details, that kind of information. So that's, that's kind of a bummer. Um, this is always the biggest problem I have with LG. It's not usually their products. It's more how they communicate with customers and evangelists and loyalists. And they leave a whole bunch of people in the lurch, you know, like they'll announce a phone and then wait a month before they tell you how and where and when you can buy it. So that's always the bummer for me with LG products is I want them to be more aggressive in putting together their carrier deals, carrier relationships, all of that fun stuff. So I am tentatively very positive on what the G7 has to offer. If only because the G7 seems to be uh, the V30 Lite that I've always wanted. I want LG to give up on these separate phone lines. Don't make a G series and a V series. Just combine them and make a big little phone towards the second half of the year. Give yourself plenty of time to get all of the manufacturing uh, issues sorted out. Plenty of time to get... Uh, chipsets because Samsung's going to suck up most of the market in the first in the first quarter, the first half of the year, and then be able to compete. You know, before Apple has their products out in the market towards the end of the year with new iPhones, it's the perfect window, and you would have a lot more goodwill in not having multiple devices kind of early and late. Or you could use the beginning of the year to launch all your mid-rangers, all of your entry-level phones, do all of that big push post-Christmas, um, post-New Year's, and then come out towards the end of the year with your baller handset, your baller hardware. Um, and there's no reason to pretend that these phones are separate anymore. The G7 is a mini V. They, they've combined. They're, they're the same product now. I, I don't see where there's any major difference. Uh, this is from Moomin. Uh, oh, we've got a bunch of comments on the G7. I'll be curious to see what you guys have to say. Um, useless notch. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, here, Wow, there's a ton of stuff here, guys. Uh, let's go. From Renato Laporte, just went to an LG store. Ma'am, do you have the G7 on display? No, sir, the G7 doesn't exist. We have the brand new G6 and V30. From Matt Josephson, I think the G7 is a huge step forward. I don't know that it's huge, but again, if you make the baby V and you touch up all the issues I had with the G6, then I'm happy. I just wish we still had phones with flat front faces. The thing I love about the G6 is 
I'm on the original, the first screen protector I got for for it back when this phone was brand new last year. I am on my third screen protector for my V, and this one's cracked too. So I have to get yet another screen protector for my V, and it's a pain because the V30 wasn't super popular. So I'm I basically only have crappy uh, crappy options for getting that replaced. Um, from Moomin, the G7 looks better than expected, but I can't give up the V20. V20 is such a monster. Uh, from from Goran Petrovic, I've never owned an LG phone, but since HTC removed everything I liked, the best replacement would be or should be LG. It's just I don't know their UI and quirks. Should I be cautious? Yes, you should. Um, really want to look at. I I am a huge fan of LG because I'm a hardware guy and I I'm willing to live with some software issues. Um, a- any manufacturer putting out you know, aggressive skins and looking at their upgrade, uh, up, update behavior. LG doesn't rank super high there. I think that's that's totally fair. But if you liked HTC because of features like boom sound and having a killer headphone jack and multimedia and content creation abilities, then LG has become the spiritual successor to everything that I loved about HTC back in the day, especially headphone audio. I cannot stress this enough. If you want like an actual best. This is not an opinion. This is not, well, I kind of feel that the sound, no, 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 no. All that's BS. If you want the best audio experience for your nice headphones, the only game in town is LG. Done. Uh, I I wish we could say that ZTE was going to be rejoining that fight, but we know they're having some problems. Um, so again, if, if what you cared about was headphone audio, uh, uh-uh, uh, LG, that's it. End of discussion. Everyone else is a distant second. I don't care that Samsung bought out my all time favorite audio manufacturer, Harman and AKG. I don't care. They've got some really nice Samsung buds in the box, earbuds in the box, but they have not incorporated into the phone the same kind of care and attention to high quality audio that LG has. So LG wins so long as I get that quad DAC. Oh, and this is an important point too from Fat Produce. Um, AT&T not carrying the G7, this might be the beginning of LG going the way of HTC unless they have a major course change. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, LG, uh, AT&T will not be carrying the G7, instead opting for the V35 because they wanted an exclusive. This is not great for AT&T, but it's terrible for LG. How they arrived at that deal still mystifies me. I have no idea how they got to that point. That is a dumb move for AT&T because the V30 and the V35 are already a year old (laughs) or will be a year old by the time we see them exclusively stocked on AT&T shelves. And we're only, if there is going to be a V40, we're only a couple months away from it if they're holding to some kind of timeline. Unless... LG is looking to shift the V to the beginning of next year, which I don't think is very likely, or at least I hope they don't because of everything that I said before. They'll try and rush the phone. They won't be able to compete with Samsung for manufacturing lines, for chipsets. I think that's a terrible, terrible position to be in. So yeah, I'm not super positive on AT&T ignoring the current phone because they wanted an exclusive on the older phone. So this is this is bad. This is not 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 a good look. Um, from Moomin, I hope the the battery on the G7 is decent. Uh, I'll be curious to see how it performs. The the V the what was it? Yeah, the V30 surprised me. Um, chipset improvements really helped that slightly smaller battery capacity. The phone still handily lasts me all day, even with pretty aggressive use. Um, uh, hopefully the G7 isn't too much of an issue there. But again, that's a, that's another thing I'll be curious to see people's takes on. I just don't really think this phone's going to get a real fair shake in terms of reviews. I think most reviews for the G7 are going to be similar to how people treat companies like HTC. They're going to it's easy to pick on LG because they are not Samsung or Apple. So, for a lot of reviewers out there to maintain what 
looks like their objectivity, they can talk real tough about LG and be real critical, or maybe next year, LG, so close, but no cigar. I'm going to stick with my Samsung and Apple. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Worth it for the monies. It's really easy because you're not going to piss off a lot of people if you, say ni- if you say critical things of LG. You have to be a lot more measured in your criticism of Samsung. You have to be a lot more measured in your criticism of Apple because that keeps people positive on your channels. Most of these channels could just switch over and be Apple Samsung channels, make all their news about Apple or Samsung, and lose, I don't know, 2% of their audience. Um, that's where we're in a, in what I feel is kind of an ugly state of tech reviewing right now, where it, it, it wouldn't cost them anything to properly, fairly review the phone on its own merits and its own deficits. But instead, I guarantee you, a good chunk of reviewers are going to focus more on why they're not going to buy it because Samsung or because Apple. And that helps them continue to look like they can offer the tough criticism when they need to. And they're not afraid to tell it like it is when that's actually kind of bogus. IMO. Anyway, let's move on. We've talked about LG. I'm just trying to see. Um, Renata Laporte between a G7 and an S9, I'd go G7. Better audio, wide-angle camera. I've no use for a zoom lens. True that. Zoom lenses suck. Wide-angle lenses are stinking rad. They are so much more practical. Um, From LGH, uh, will you review the XZ2? At first, I hated the look, but seeing and holding it in the store, I have my doubts now. I am trying to get my hands on a Sony as we speak. Um, I do have a Huawei P20 Pro lined up, uh, so I won't be getting my hands on it this week. I'll probably be going hands on next week. Again, being in the United States, that phone was a little bit trickier to get than I thought it would be. Um, but I'm not sure how long I'm going to get it. So I'm going to focus on doing a P20 Pro uh, camera review and audio review, and those will be Patreon exclusives. So uh, just because of the way that YouTube production works and how YouTube doesn't pay anything anymore, it's not worth it for me to put it out there in the public because I'm already making almost as much money on Patreon as I am on YouTube, even with my few subscribers. We're getting actually pretty close to unlocking on the Patreon, unlocking the uh, the credits, where at the end of every episode, I'll put up credits for who's supporting my channel and also do a little uh, end of video uh, plug like I used to on Pocket Now, like a little uh, Easter egg end of video just to say thanks to everybody. So Z2, XZ2 is definitely on my list because I flippin' love my Xperia XZ1 Compact. Um, even for how much the camera fights me and how mediocre the headphone jack is, That is such an epic little Mighty Mouse phone. Uh, It's the only thing that properly competes against my love for the iPhone SE. So I I really am trying to get my hands on an XE2, if not an XE2 Premium, because I really want to see what a UHD screen can do. Uh, More comments, P20 Pro... Um, from Gorin, I hate how the P20 Pro is overrated and G7 already underrated. It's amazing what third camera, um, it's amazing what third camera did to reviewers. So I'll be curious to see, cause I'll be going hands on with the P20 Pro and see how far I can push that thing. But more for me, it's, it's, um, whether or not, um, whether what, what it, it, for me it's whether or not this improves some of the more photographic and cinematic aspects of photography I, i'm a little less concerned about the the low light performance like pushing more extreme low light performance i don't think is a huge benefit our small f- smartphone cameras already do an amazing job at night I, if you see my view 10 uh, i did the honor view 10 camera review no optical image stabilization fairly small camera sensors and i didn't have problems pulling off clear shots at night the noise reduction is is a mess um it makes everything look plasticky but it's it's already really good so for me more i want to see better clearer natural bokeh focus fall off from your uh, from your subject and i want to see those elements that made the 1020 such an interesting camera but now brought into a world of uhd video you know, that to me could be really exciting, especially, you know, with HEVC compression. So anyway, um, well, there'll be a lot more phone news. Um, and uh, um, we'll, we'll, 
we'll see uh, a bunch of people. I just saw like, you know, woots on the Patreon. No, the, the Patreon experiment has been very slow, but has been very interesting because I think I bit off a little bit more than I could chew at first, but I'm starting to find my footing on how to offer perks, how to do giveaways uh, and how to produce content specifically for the Patreon. And I'm not interested in being uh, YouTube successful. YouTube does not support me. It does not support uh, mid, mid-sized, mid mid-tier creators. And there's a group of people out there that is not only interested in participating and being active, but of, of supporting my channel, supporting my actual production. So I've been getting a lot of angry tweets from people saying like, hey, it's not cool that you're putting your camera stuff behind a paywall. Um, you, would be, you would be more successful and I would be more interested in working or sharing your stuff if you made it public. And those are all coming from people that I know have never supported my channel, have never shared my content. So if you won't even share stuff for free, <laughs> what makes me want to give you stuff for free? Is Again, it's like geeks and enthusiasts are the absolute worst overall demographic for that kind of conversation because they're the people least likely to interact with ads. They have the most demands on the quality of content that you produce. And so now I've created this Patreon and I have found a core group of people who genuinely want to support my content. I want to make stuff for you guys. Let's move a, some of the conversation over there too. And that's eventually where the ad-free version of this podcast is going to go. So if you like listening to, listening to this podcast and you don't want to have to interact with ads, then they're going to get a no ad version, an RSS feed just for them, a no ad version of the SGGQA podcast, the interviews that I've got lined up, and just all the other conversations. Like when we have a geek debate, that's where it's going to go, and it's going to go ad free. So uh, moving on, I have talked way too long about that, longer than I intended to. G7, I'll let you all know if I, if and when um, I get my hands on a G7, but it might end up being like Samsung. The only Galaxy phone I'm interested in reviewing is the Active. That's the only Samsung phone that looks like it might be made for me. I'm not interested in any other curvy, glass-backed, flimsy, fragile phones that cost eight, $900. I want the smaller screened Galaxy S9 with a rugged back and a larger battery. All of those things are the active. <laughs> so that's the only Galaxy phone I'm interested in reviewing. If it takes me too long to get my hands on a G7, then I'll, I might end up skipping it and just going to the next V because the V is my bay. That is my absolute um, bestest love it device. So, uh, so we'll see. Um, sorry, I just saw this from Creative School. Sony can make bigger camera sensors, so why, why don't they? That's a very good question, and I don't know that anyone has a, hue, uh, has a good reason for that, but the camera sensors that they put into their phones are flipping phenomenal. It's just they can't write camera apps to save their lives, IMO. Okay, moving right along. This is another story that got a lot of buzz, uh, especially towards the end of last week over the weekend. NVIDIA pulling the plug on the GPP. This is the GeForce Partner Program. And uh, this, is, this is actually from NVIDIA, the NVIDIA blog. I'll have a link to this in the show notes. A lot has been said recently about our GeForce Partner Program. The rumors, conjecture, and mistruths go far beyond its intent. Rather than battling misinformation, we have decided to cancel the program. Now, let's play a game. I love playing games. If the GPP was so benign... Why is NVIDIA taking their ball and going home? Huh? If the GPP was so benign, why don't they just release what the partners were asked to do? The actual documents just release the partner program and let us take a look at what your requirements were for. <laughs> If the GPP was so benign, why did so many of their manufacturing partners start looking at ways to build new brands for other products that incorporated AMD kit? So this is exactly the bullshit that we were talking about and having such a restrictive. According to rumors and according to some of the leaks that were put out there about the GPP, 
This radically, th this would have given manufacturers a few uh, manufacturers of GPUs a few perks in terms of advertising, in terms of partner programs, what Nvidia was going to promote, and access to certain developer toolkits um, earlier. Uh, especially in terms of the uh, software that NVIDIA was putting out too. I'm grossly oversimplifying this just to get through this quickly because I don't want to spend a ton of time on it. But if but the flip side of that was, let's say you had a gaming-focused brand for your GPUs, you could not use the same brand for NVIDIA GPUs as you could for AMD GPUs. And we saw this when Asus put out a press release saying they were going to create a new... Ares brand for AMD GPUs that would be kind of up there with their ROG brand, their Republic of Gamers brand, but they couldn't be under the same label because reasons, because of the GPP. So Asus was on the hook for creating a whole new brand, knowing that it would probably suffer in the market opposite Strix and ROG because those are established Asus brand names. And, the, you know, what kind of support they were going to get on the back end for really trying to promote that? None. So they were having to foot the bill for continuing to include AMD in their product lineup. That's a really crappy thing to do. That is, that is an anti-competitive thing to do. And that really gets close to some kind of regulatory oversight when we start looking at, you know, trade and, uh, and uh, how, how products are sold. So... Again, do, do, do any of you have any, any faith <laughs> that the GPP was really as benign as NVIDIA was making it out to be? What I, what I think is hilarious, too, is uh, we saw a whole bunch of undie twisted back and forth. Um, so, so what's hilarious, the, uh, the different people involved in, in commenting on computer hardware, gaming, PC building, stuff like that, like Linus and, and was it Hard OCP, a couple other tech outlets. You know, these headlines came out and you're like, oh, yay, GPP is dead. And then people from like sort of the harder edged line of PC building were like, you don't get to celebrate. We're the ones who did all the work. You just sat back and now you're taking credit for the GPP being killed. And it's hilarious that like the, the, the gaming market has been so bifurcated on who did enough to help kill the GPP and who didn't do enough to kill the GPP. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a pretty funny roundup of people, uh, commenting on, on the behind the scenes machinations of, uh, of NVIDIA and GPUs. So we'll have to see, uh, I think it was last week or maybe the week before talking about how, uh, GPU prices might be set to fall. I still haven't seen much evidence that uh, graphics cards are any more affordable or closer to MSRP than they were a week ago. And we're getting really close to Computex. So I'm assuming we'll see some uh, some new hardware announcements coming out there. I think we're going to try and cover it for uh, for Newegg. I, I, I'm already looking at what travel might be like to get out to Taipei. So hopefully we'll have some cool stuff to talk about for PC builders and for gamers. Um, we've been getting a lot of teases from manufacturers, Corsair, Intel, um, uh, Zotac, Asus, obviously, um, about what kind of stuff they might be talking about once we're on the ground in Taipei. So it should be pretty sweet, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do there. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't have any comments on that. Okay, so moving right along. Real quick. Uh, this is a pair of stories because I always love, you know, taking a taking a bite out of Facebook whenever I have the chance. Facebook accused of introducing extremists to one another through suggested friends features. <laughs> so, uh, Facebook has helped introduce thousands of Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant extremists to one another via its suggested friends feature. The social media giant, which is already under fire for failing to remove terrorist material from its platform, is now accused of actively connecting jihadists around the world, allowing them to develop fresh terror networks and even recruit new members to their cause. This is by way of The Telegraph. Again, I'll have a, a link to this article in the show notes. Um, just one part of a pair of stories on Facebook. Again, I don't know about you, you folks out there listening to this or watching to this, but it really does seem to me that this is a bad omen for the future of artificial intelligence. 
Okay, that was that was a pretty big jump to get there to explain. Um, when it comes to just dumb sorting and matching algorithms, so a bunch of coders are trying to find ways to keep you using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any other social network as long as they can. They want your eyeballs on their service for as long as they can manufacture a system that will keep you interested in what they have to talk about. These algorithms, I'm sure, are immensely complex, but they already seem to be out of control. The people who are developing the software don't seem to have a good handle on what the impact of these algorithms mean in terms of real-world usage and what they're actually facilitating by creating these sorting and matching systems. Uh, it's kind of like when Microsoft put out one of their AI chatbots, and that chatbot just went out and consumed a whole bunch of stuff on Twitter, and within a day was was just vomiting just the most hateful, uh, bigoted, racist speech because of what it was consuming on Twitter. Uh, what it was finding on Twitter it would go down one path, and then it wouldn't have a good escape route from just terrible, hateful ideology, so it would just start interacting and engaging with that ideology. So uh, I kind of feel like Facebook is already, you know, uh, exhibit number one, exhibit A, for how little we understand systems that can learn, grow, accrue information and come up with answers and conclusions based on the data that they traffic. Uh, th this, this, you know, uh, the sensationalized nature of this, oh, Facebook is is making new terrorist cells. No, not really, but uh, they seem to help facilitate in pairing people up to echo chamber. You know, finding people with like uh, interests and making sure that they have clear and easy ways to find each other and to propagate information that they already agree with. So that's... That's a problem. How do we solve that problem? No one really seems to have a good idea. And I bet least of all, uh, Facebook really doesn't seem to have any vested interest in immediately fixing that issue because it's the core backbone of their service. Uh, if they fix it, that really means they're breaking some of the ability to match people up with each other. And we're seeing this across numerous other platforms, too. I would say Reddit has a humongous problem with user base and with the inconsistency of how they deem some uh, public forums to be acceptable and other pub public forums to be unacceptable. YouTube has a massive problem with uh, putting out, propagating uh, fake news, if we're going to be using that phrase. I had to eye roll so hard I almost dislocated my right eye. Um, how they're propagating fake news, conspiracy theories, um, or just serving terrible content to kids while also um, preventing people from consuming the content that they might actually enjoy. You know, their, their system of, you know, oh, subscribe and smash that bell icon. Well, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> if you're watching this on the YouTubes and you're subscribed to my channel, uh, you know, we all know YouTube has a terrible system for notifications and alerts to the content you might actually want to see. But go to your YouTube homepage and I bet very much, I will bet a significant sum of money that if I were sitting next to you and you pulled up YouTube.com, you just, you were on that homepage that precious few of those videos would actually be videos you would be interested in watching. Again, I cannot tell YouTube enough that I am not interested in Phil DeFranco. Cool guy, makes some great stuff. He's not my jam for how I like to consume news on the internet. I think he gets way too embroiled in YouTube drama. That's not something I'm interested in. He is always a part of, in some tier of my recommended videos. So I think it's more likely YouTube is just serving people up stuff that they already know is popular. And that way they don't have to worry about trying to build up new channels, which might be inconsistent in how they deliver content or the message by which they do. Or they just outright ban videos about guns. I am not a huge uh, gun fan in the way that the NRA is supporting uh, gun manufacturers and gun enthusiasts right now. I was a shooting sports instructor for the Boy Scouts of America, and I have a very different relationship with guns than a lot of the people that seem to use them as uh, genital extensions. So that's a bummer because now they're just 
pushing gun videos off of the channel, that's just going to radicalize the behavior of people that were already obnoxious about their Second Amendment rights. That's not the right way to go about fixing this problem. Another major problem um, from Demir Frank, YouTube recommendations actually works great for me. Well, bully for you, Demir. You're just super great. Actually, you are super great. You should go check out his channel. He's actually pretty awesome. So uh, <laughs> uh, this is another uh, quick, uh, quick, vi uh, quick news topic. We don't have to spend a lot of time on this one. But again, it it's important to just keep a handle on what's happening in the world of data and your privacy. Cambridge Analytica dismantled for good. Nope, it just changed its name to Emmerdata. This is by way of The Register, theregister.co.uk. The company formerly known as Cambridge Analytica shocked the media today when it announced an immediate shutdown and liquidation of its business. That shutdown, however, may be short-lived as official documents indicate those behind the controversial analytics company will be launching as a new firm with a less toxic brand. Yup. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised. Data is becoming the new credit. So what happens with banking institutions, credit checking companies? I think John Oliver did a piece about this. He got deep into conversations about like uh, Equifax and stuff like that. But now your personal data, your marketable data is kind of going the same way. Uh, it's... Um, it's not surprising. Uh, we'll file this again, like I said, on the Board at Work podcast. A lot of this news filed under not surprising, still disappointing. Um, so, yeah, be, be on the lookout for multiple firms to rise. I think from Cambridge Analytica being liquidated, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, we're going to see a, lo a lot of minor players try and rise up to fill some of that data scraping need, data scraping need. Uh, and of course, if the people backing Cambridge Analytica are just rebranding, well, then that's going to be an easy play too. So be on the lookout for headlines. I don't know, excuse me, maybe in another year about Emmer data in another scandal involving ripping off your consumer data. All right. Uh, like I said, I didn't want to focus on that too much because I've got two stories about Tesla. Um, one kind of interesting, this one, I'm not entirely sure how to feel about this because we're, we're talking free markety stuff. Tesla starts brutal review of contractors firing everyone that is not vouched for by an employee. So uh, this is by way of electrek.co. Over the past few weeks, see Tesla CEO Elon Musk has been warning of a focus on efficiency at Tesla's Fremont factory, and he has been expressing a specific concern over contractors and subcontractors working at the automaker. This is via an email that Electrek got. I have been disappointed to discover how many contractor companies are interwoven throughout Tesla. Often, it's like a Russian nesting doll of contractor, subcontractor, subcontractor, etc. before you finally find someone doing actual work. This means a lot of middle managers adding cost, but not doing anything obviously useful. And the letter goes on and on and on. And there are multiple emails. Again, I'll have a link on this. Definitely want to check that out. Um, this is such an interesting read because Tesla, again, small boutique company trying to make some very aggressive pushes. The next story we've got about Tesla, very aggressive iterations on new technology and manufacturing, some really exciting stuff. So I could see where Elon Musk is something of a megalomaniac, again, sort of a Steve Jobsian kind of figure at, in, at the head of his company, um, would be interested in really trying to cut fat, right? You know, really trying to maximize the efficiency of the entire process from soup to nuts. So much so that, you know, they're looking at what we're going to be talking about is battery manufacturing next. Some really exciting improvements there. But the thing that I think bothers me about this is it feels a little unprofessional or it feels a little punitive to be going through a contractor review in a public employee focused fashion. So one of the further emails is, you know, they're looking to fire contractors unless during this review an employee vouches for the contractor in question. And that puts the reputation of the contractor on the Tesla employee who's standing up for them. And contractors are not always going to be consistent 
in everything that they do. So let's say an employee vouches for a contractor. The market takes some kind of hit. Contractor can't deliver in the way that they originally set out to do. You would say, okay, well, the contractor should have been able to foresee that or the contractor should be able to find a solution around it. That's what the contractor's for. But now it's also tied to the employee that vouched for them. And that's the thing to me that is making me... N not nervous. What's the word I want to use? Is making me anxious? Is making is making this feel a little unseemly? How do you how do you quantify that? How do you protect? Uh, how do you protect the employee in question in regards to them putting their necks out for someone or them vouching for someone else's business or work or behavior? And and that just seems unfair. Um, and, and it seems kind of petty coming from coming directly from Elon Musk. Again, huge amount of respect for the guy, and he's done some incredible things. But every now and then you get some of this little pushback. You know, that's it's important that our economy, our society have people who can act as disruptors. But, man, does that mean those are exactly the kinds of individuals that I do not think I would ever want to spend much time with or work with directly or have a relationship with because that is not my jam. That is not my speed. So um, from Ruari, a Tesla Model S is nearly 200,000 euro here in Ireland. Madness. Uh, from Adida, doesn't the government provide subsidies for Tesla owners, though? And then from Ruari, even after the subsidies, it's still insane money. Plus, our government are a shower of knobs. <laughs> Oh, Rari, I kind of feel like that's a sentiment that many people can express today. I will handily you know, handshake with you that our government is a shower full of knobs. Um, but this is this is what this this is what's going to be sort of critical about that Tesla story. So Elon Musk, uh, you know, again, sort of a jobs megalomaniac, you know, type A, intense, sacrifice everything else about his personal life to manage the businesses that he works with. Uh, this, this headline is inaccurate, but the, the process improvements are still incredible. So this is the first story I saw on it. This is coming from nextbigfuture.com. They have not corrected, um, the, this, uh, uh, this headline. So Tesla making model three battery packs in 17 minutes down from seven hours. So that's not the true improvement, but the improvement is pretty substantial. Um, I actually did pull it up on, on. Uh, oh, are you not going to go back to Reddit? Come on, go back. Nope. Okay, it's dead. Never mind, folks. But oh, there it goes. Okay. So um, I heard the seventeen was a mistake, and that it's actually seventy minutes. So that's the actual process improvement. If you go through the earnings call, so from seven hours to 70 minutes so from seven hours to uh, basically an hour and 10 minutes that's huge and that's what's exciting about watching what this company is trying to accomplish i don't believe in the market cap on tesla i don't believe their valuation is accurate i think there's a lot of speculation in the market but when we're talking about a battery process improvement that's radically faster almost seven times faster uh that's a huge push in the right direction especially as we're watching these manufacturing centers start to pop up more and closer to where the cars are actually assembled it's one of the big issues i have with hybrids the the carbon footprint in manufacturing a, hy a hybrid car causes people to spread out manufacturing all over the planet which creates a lot more pollution that that car has to work off while it's out in the field especially at a time where americans are being dumb again way way more sales on sport utility vehicles and light trucks um because we apparently don't have any kind of memory for the last time we had um an oil rise a gas prices rise and all of the headlines here in, in California were hilarious. Oh, I'm having to drive my SUV to the pump, and it's so expensive to fill up my car. Like, okay. And we saw a huge rise in sales of fuel-efficient vehicles and hybrids. And now that gas prices have fallen, oh, I'm going to go back to buying an SUV again because I, I can't think more than 10 minutes ahead of what I've got to do today. Uh, dumb. Super dumb. And uh, I, I, I love listening to people complain, well, electric cars just don't have the infrastructure, you know, so it's just not as good. And 
sure. But I guess, you know, this is one of the things that I hate about the current state of conversation about consumer electronics, consumer appliances, consumer gadgets. Well, it's not completely perfect in exactly the way that I currently use the thing I already have. So it's just not good enough. I just can't do it. It just I, I won't. And you're like, well, then, yeah, you're going to hold back progress. I saw another article. I was actually going to put it in the rundown. You know, like carbon carbon emissions are still on the rise. Temperature is spiking in uh, global uh, is spiking faster than global estimates. We're going to see even more runoff temperature shift. Uh, that's going to cause major issues with you know uh, exaggerating storms. You know, weather conditions, disease spread, food population management. All of that stuff, super bad. So what do we do about it? We go out and we buy more SUVs. Wah, wah. But this is, this is the happy side of the Tesla story. If you were looking at Tesla battery manufacturing, this to me is one of those things that enforces why you might want to own stock in Tesla as a company. Because the Model 3 battery pack, getting the manufacturing time down on that is super exciting because they've got to start making more of those cars. The cars um, are not uh, being delivered as, as quickly as anyone would like. But those manufacturing processes are also going to help reduce costs for things like um, their home batteries. So you can get Powerwall and stick it up in, in your garage, and hopefully that will either increase capacity or reduce the cost of investing in a home battery solution. And there was a new uh, piece of legislation. I seriously doubt it's going to go through. Um, but just where, where some of uh, the local politics scene is at, California is looking to mandate that future homes being built will include solar. It is ridiculous to me that uh, states in the Southwest are not making a more aggressive push on solar. We've got great subsidies, but too many people are hanging out in this, well, I'll wait until solar's better. Well, solar is always going to get better. You can't not buy forever. <laughs> and it's one of those really obnoxious things like I'm in a condo right now I would love to be able to to retrofit or to to go solar but the house uh, you know the houses in the neighborhoods that we're looking at, at buying or moving to I I'm I'm going to be pushing hard for either pre-built solar on that house or of making it a part of an early loan on retrofitting and improving that house to go directly into solar and I'll be looking at fitting it with a battery too uh, so that we can stay as as much as we can off of peak usage rates uh, for for our neck of the woods. In California, it gets real bad. You know, it, it's May, and we're already in some super hot weather, some patches of of mid nineties. When it comes August, I won't be surprised if we hit one fifteen in the valley regularly. Let alone maybe even a peak at one twenty. So we'll have to see how far off I am there. But. If Tesla can, can reduce the manufacturing costs and the manufacturing time for this type of technology, yeah, that's going to be some real good money for them coming up soon. Uh, we've got a bunch of things here. Let's see. Um, I don't expect much from a man from Tesla company that respect more Thomas Edison and actually doesn't know anything about Nikola Tesla. I don't know what that means. From Rari, uh, there's a big push here in Ireland for hybrids and electric cars, but most of our energy comes from fossil fuels. You Americans have it lucky when it comes to driving a car compared to Ireland. Um, well, we're still pretty heavy on fossil fuels too, but we are working to minimize coal. I mean, like just the market itself is working to minimize coal. So everyone who voted for coal jobs, that wasn't a smart play. Uh, from LGH, driving is indeed very cheap in the U.S. compared to most European countries. It's expensive here in the Netherlands as well. So this is one of the things that, that really pisses me off as someone who does value free market economies is the reason it's cheap here is because we keep subsidizing coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Uh, if we weren't subsidizing these fuels, then our prices would look a lot more like Europe, especially building in the costs to offset the amount of infrastructure it takes to help clean up after these efforts. So right now, we're giving <laughs> these companies who are already ridiculously successful more perks. That's what we're doing. And, and we're sitting there and stomping, oh, well, it's about free market. And, and, coal, and wind and solar just aren't good enough because they can't compete when they already are like without subsidies, look at Texas. Texas is making a grip of cash on wind right now without, you know, because, you know, Texas is not about giving companies money unless it's oil. Um, so it's uh, it, it's it's really frustrating to see 
how low those prices are in the United. Not like I want to make this like a, a you know a class warfare issue, but it's really frustrating to see how how much lower our fuel prices are because that's not really reflective of the costs associated. It's our government giving preferential treatment, picking winners and losers for one industry over another, while we've got a bunch of pundits and guys like Joe Rogan, oh, no, electric, can't do it. You know, recharge, you know, the re- there's not rechargers everywhere I want there to be, and it takes too long. Like, well, we could solve that problem if we had real competition at the pump. If I could roll up to a pump and have a pump for gasoline, for electric, for a hydrogen, um, if, if I really rolled up and I had that competition, then we wouldn't be having this this discussion. You get behind the wheel of an electric car, and it is way more exciting for the price to drive than uh, than a gas powered car. Even uh, when I was tooling around with my buddy Chris in his Nissan Leaf, that thing could come off the line and totally shock a bunch of low-end Mustangs. That was a fun little zippy car to drive around L.A. traffic. Oh, but the battery range isn't good enough. Yeah, well, it gets better when we actually invest in it. And that's a put-your-money-where-your-mouth-is thing. That's not a conscientious objector wait-and-see thing. God, I'm so upset. If I hadn't wrecked my my little Nissan hatchback, we would probably have an electric car already. Um... Oh, from from brewery. Say brewery without the B. <laughs> from brewery. Uh, correcting my pronunciation on his name. Um, uh, for example, I drive a 2006 Saab 9.3. Absolutely adore Saabs. My all-time favorite car is the Saab 99. Uh, I love Saabs like I love bags and hats. Uh, Saab 93 2.0 petrol. It's 710 euro a year to tax it. My car insurance is 1,200 a year. Petrol is 138 euro a liter. Um, 710 is a road tax. After 2008, it went on CO2 emissions. Before 2008, it was on engine size. Again, I, you know, the eurozone has some major issues with car manufacturers being able to game uh, the metrics on that kind of stuff. That is one thing that doing a little bit better there but we're doing a little bit better here but it's still worldwide we're not really doing anything to address the major issues that are plaguing uh some of these climate change situations and i know i'm going to get a bunch of hate mail on that um moving right along so this is a whole series of of stories on uh net neutrality and uh internet service providers so i'm going to blow through these real fast okay So uh, starting off with Medium, and this is the one I'm going to start with and then come back to. I know you're tired of hearing about net neutrality. I'm tired of writing about it, but the Senate is about to vote and it's time to pay attention. TLDR, the Senate is about to vote on a resolution to save net neutrality. So put your websites, subreddits, apps, and social accounts on red alert starting May 9th. I am recording this on May 7th. I would really like to see some activity, some discussion on this. We've just got to push, I think, one or two GOP members over into this resolution vote so that we can actually take some action against net neutrality. After all of the headlines that were coming out about how net neutrality is dead, it wasn't dead. But this is the bureaucracy at play, and this is how things function when we get or dysfunction when it gets to D.C. But we're yet again in another holding pattern where this is now one of the last stages to fully enacting the removal of net neutrality. At the same time, uh, this one is a little tricky to untangle, but it's a state story. This is coming from the Connecticut Mirror, the ctmirror.org. Excuse me, ctmirror.org. Senate passes bill to restore net neutrality in Connecticut. State Senate brought back by a single vote Friday a bill intended to restore Connecticut's ability to prohibit internet service providers from blocking websites or charging them for faster delivery of content. This is a tied vote. In the Connecticut Senate, which was broken by the lieutenant governor, and now it goes on to the Connecticut House. And we're seeing a ton of these state initiatives really trying to push forward in um, at the same time that a bunch of states attorneys general are suing the FCC over removing net neutrality. The state legislatures are also trying to enact local laws. Again, kind of a nightmare scenario for consumers and for companies if there are 50 different versions of net neutrality that play all out at the state level. Ironically, this is a situation where the FCC could come in and say, no, 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 
we don't believe in states' rights as conservatives. As conservatives, we believe the federal government should have the power to eliminate the state's ability to protect net neutrality, which is hilarious. Uh, we've got liberals fighting for states' rights right now because at the same time, I, I recently talked about the California bill that was getting stuck in committee, was going to have a bunch of riders on it, finally went up um, without riders, passed committee. We're going to, I think we're going to see a vote on it. But that uh, almost that exact same bill is now heading to New York. So uh, the New York legislature is looking at recreating nearly the same uh, protections that were built into the California bill, which is even stricter than what was what the FCC was going to be tasked with protecting in terms of net neutrality. In California, the bill was approved last month by two Senate committees, despite protests from AT&T and cable lobbyists. It needs to go through one more committee before getting a vote on the full uh, vote of the full state Senate. Uh, today, a lawmaker in New York said he has teamed up with the California bill's author to introduce an equivalent bill New York legi- uh, in the New York uh, legislature. Uh, Again, this is from Ars Technica. The bicoastal bill effort to restore the rights of an open and free Internet through net neutrality legislation would cover nearly one fifth of the American population, one fifth of the United States, if two states enact the proposed law. The California and New York state senators said in their joint announcement, which would be a huge deal. Again, uh, California was just ranked the world's fifth largest economy. I I think, who did we just beat? We just beat Paris and the UK. Um, Yeah, so we've got our issues with debt and deficit spending and uh, some major problems, uh, especially in, in, in my opinion, one of the things that's a major problem is that we give way more money to the federal government than we get back to subsidize a bunch of red states that are failing their local constituents in their economies, especially with governors that are all about taking money from the federal government and not giving enough back. Uh, But I digress. So uh, major, major steps forward if we see this kind of pressure put on. May 9th is an amazingly important day to rejoin the conversation, to annoy people, and also to send some word to your local officials. If your local officials, like me in California, I'm already pretty confident that they're going to be voting for anything that is pro-net neutrality because of especially of the state pressure that we've been putting on it. Um, but our, you know, our, our federal legislators are probably already on board. It'll be a time for me to also put my money where my mouth is and saying I'll support their future campaigns and I'll be looking forward to to having conversations with them about this in the future. I really miss uh, Henry Waxman because he was super active with his constituents. And when I lived in his district before he retired, I, I actually had a series of of email conversations with him. And it might have been with a staffer, but if it was, it was still someone taking a personal interest in my messages regarding uh, what was it at the time? It was the McCain I forget who else. McCain co-sponsored the Broadband Consumer Choice Act, which removed all choice from the consumers. <laughs> we love to do that in politics. So uh, this this is a, a big deal story for those of us who care about keeping the Internet as a fair and even playing field uh, for new products and new services. Um, I have yet to find good arguments against net neutrality where they're not conflating competition with services against competition for access. Again, whether or not we're, we're badging the internet as, uh, as an information service um, or a distribution service or whatever you know, linguistic uh, tricks that they're playing to push this forward, um, the, the ability to access the internet without interference from the person who owns the pipe and without prohibitive data caps, without throttling, and without preferential treatment to services who are already players is a big deal. We would not need net neutrality if we had better competition at the city and state level. Because if any company were engaged in manipulative business practices, they would lose in the market. However, we have state and city laws that in many areas in this country are preventing competition. So if you really care about competition and you agree with me that regulation is a problem, the problem is not at the FCC regulating how we access the Internet. The problem is at the city and state level with city and state politicians 
allowing major corporations to help them write legislation which prevents competition. That's the problem we need to address. Net neutrality does not help us address that problem significantly. If we really care about free market economics, if we really care about a free economy, capitalist economy, that's what we need to address. If you go into a, a rural area of the United States, they might not have anyone serving them broadband or true broadband. They'll play tricks with like, well, satellite high-speed internet, but it's not real broadband. Um, or if you're even in a major city like I am, I still only have access to one cable player. I cannot vote with my wallet in, <laughs> in the valley in California. So that's what we need to address. Once we can fix those problems, the idea that the FCC is just going to go stomping around the Internet, throwing around net neutrality um, issues is kind of specious. The FCC is a woefully underfunded regulatory agency and is highly reactive only to major problems that it seeks under its purview. So if we could improve competition at the city level, then there would be a very low likelihood that we would need to enact any of these FCC regulations against a major player. So that's that's where we're at. And May 9th is going to be yet another step towards dismantling what few consumer protections we actually have. If you care about business, if you care about improving competition, if you care about fair pricing for consumers, then this is what you should be taking a look at supporting. Regardless of whether or not you feel that this is a partisan issue, this is an economic issue. This is an economic situation. And it's one of the few that a majority of liberal and conservative economists can agree on. So that's my, that's my take on it. I would still very much be interested in anyone who has what they feel is a good faith argument against net neutrality in terms of this business space, in terms of how killing net neutrality and giving up preferential treatment to the top players of the internet service economy can improve competition for services on the internet. As we've been talking about companies like Comcast looking at new throttling, Verizon relocking cell phones, uh, Verizon packaging Oath apps and services on Galaxy hardware. So if you buy a Galaxy phone on Verizon, it's going to be packed full of their own services. Again, where we feel that this will actually improve situations before we fix the issue with real competition for the connectivity space. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a couple comments on this looking up. Oh, more, more people talking about Tesla and gas and batteries. If you could fill your Tesla 50% battery in five minutes at the gas station, it would make sense. From Q3 Becker, you should look at some of the, uh, the videos that we've seen on battery swapping. Um, Tesla actually had a demo on the Model S where they could swap the battery twice in the same amount of time that you could refill the tank. Um, but again, we'd need more infrastructure on that. and We'd need a better system of battery leasing. Uh, than what we currently have, but we can't get there because everyone's still burning petrol. Ha, ha, ha. Um, oh, man. Uh, from Ruri, I'm not a fan of the EU, but the fact that they protect net neutrality here is a positive. And then there's a, a conversation going on about uh, Ireland profits from the EU, though. Other countries have been very critical of Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain in this respect. Um, those other countries were in a different situation to us. Our debt. Oh, okay. So yeah, this this is a longer conversation that I can unravel while it's happening in the live chat. Um, but yeah. So as as an additional data point. Um, oops, I just spilled coffee all over my leg, and I'm going to drink some more coffee. Um, this comes from the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. This is a very good read to help spread. Uh, some of the ideas that I was talking about. The big lie ISPs are spreading in state legislatures is that they don't make enough money. Uh, top paragraph of this story, which I'll have a link to. In their effort to prevent states from protecting a free and open internet, a small handful of massive and extraordinarily profitable internet service providers, ISPs, are telling state legislatures that network neutrality would hinder their ability to raise revenues to pay for upgrades and thus force them to charge consumers higher bills for internet access. This is because state-based network neutrality will prohibit data discrimination schemes known as paid prioritization, where the ISP charges websites and applications new tolls and relegate those 
that do not pay to the slower lane of internet traffic. And again, we've been seeing a ton of arguments about why ending net neutrality is going to be important for businesses. Whether or not a company invests in rolling out infrastructure has almost nothing to do with the services used on that infrastructure. I'm going to repeat that. Whether or not a company invests in improving uh, an area's infrastructure has almost nothing to do with the services used on that infrastructure. And this is the campaign of misinformation that politicians have been putting out ever since Orrin Hatch was stumbling around calling the Internet a series of tubes. And I don't want my Internet stuck behind another person's Internet because if I have an Internet and they have an Internet and he's getting a movie on his Internet and I'm just sending a, a notepad on my Internet, then my Internet and his Internet, all fake, all dumb. So this EFF article goes goes into some some really great talking point paragraph um, bullet points as to the whole situation that, that's, that's, uh, that's being enacted. The biggest cost for an ISP is the initial deployment, not the use. So once you invest in better nodes and let's say you invest in fiber to home, that infrastructure is a license to print money. We've already seen the fastest ISPs are those who are already adhering to network neutrality and privacy policies, and they're making tons of cash. I tweeted it, and I'll see if I can find a link to it, but um, the CEO of Sonic, um, let me see, I, I thought I had it up here. I don't know that I did. Um, let me see if I can find Sonic. Uh, I can't find it. But anyway, I, I believe Sonic sells gigabit broadband in some cities for as low as $50 a month. So look at your cable bill. If you're like me somewhere else in the United States, I'm spending three times that for one quarter the download speed and one fortieth the upload speed. That's, that's ridiculous. And do you know why I'm stuck at that is because I have no competition. And, and I have no, no business voting with my wallet, with my money. So once you've invested in that infrastructure, you, you don't have to ream the consumer to make a handy profit. And Sonic has shown us this in the markets that they sell broadband. So, and charging, and, and that Sonic is a, is a public company. It's, it's, oh no, sorry, it's a private company. It's not a public infrastructure like I've been um, celebrating Chattanooga, Tennessee, which was built on a grant from the Department of Energy and is, man is managed by uh, Chattanooga's power, uh, power uh, company. You don't need to go private company to get insane speed improvements and still be ridiculously profitable while offering those at consistent prices with what we're currently paying for cable and without having to enact data caps. Again, this, this falsehood of bandwidth being this precious limited supply is completely specious and completely false and does not really move the needle on the net neutrality discussion. Almost all of this has to do with that profitability and state and local government. What they're trying to do is entrench a market so that they can continue to reap incredible profits while not necessarily having to invest any money in improving infrastructure. So again, the killer, the killer wedge to this argument is competition. Uh, we already pay more than enough to get high speed, affordable internet where our privacy is protected and net neutrality is preserved. Again, at this point, it's all about just trying to squeeze blood from a stone. So you, they're already making money on you connecting to the internet through their modem. So an ISP already makes money from you. The ISP also already makes money from businesses that, that pay to send you services. So they get to double dip. Every piece of internet traffic is monetized twice from, from sender and receiver. Then a lot of them are now writing into their terms of service that they can track your user, user data. They are serving up pieces of software that interact with your browser that can hijack uh, your search queries to uh, to better support their internal advertising. And they're also now going to be penalizing 
some of the service providers who don't pay them enough. So the service providers have to pay more for their data services to the ISP. And we'll probably start seeing like tears and caps and throttling for the consumer once this lobster pots up. It's not going to happen tomorrow. This is what's so frustrating. Let's say this vote doesn't go our way May 9th. A week later, you're going to see a bunch of conservatives stomping around saying, see, internet still exists. I still streamed a movie on Netflix. Everything's fine. Don't look here anymore. And then months later, we're going to see a couple terms of service changes, some some end user licensing agreement changes. Going to start hearing a few stories in the background. Netflix having throttling problems in some communities. Uh, Hulu or Amazon working out deals with how they can incorporate into, you know, a carrier or ISP infrastructure. We start hearing about like like paid prioritized data like AT&T is doing where, you know, some companies don't count against your data cap and some companies do or some companies get throttled or, you know, the video streaming on Hulu looks amazing, but the video streaming on Netflix is only 480p. You're going to start seeing those percolate and start rising up, but by then it's too late. They already have what they want. And even then, when we get an administration change, at some point, even if it's another conservative administration, if we were to try and change that, it would take us years of fighting. The, the original open Internet order was a fight 10 years in the making before we got the bare minimum consumer protections at the FCC uh, under the Obama administration. And these things aren't that strict. There are a number of other things like the state bills that are going up are even stricter than what the FCC was going to do. So an incredibly frustrating turn of events and an incredibly frustrating situation where none of this is, is, is really accurate. If you care about business and you care about making things better and you care about capitalism, then you should be voting liberal on this. 99% of GOP elected officials have voted against net neutrality. 98% of elected liberal, progressive, independent, and Democrat uh, politicians have voted in favor of net neutrality. There really isn't an argument to be made here that I found that reconciles those differences and helps us untangle or unravel why conservatives have a good faith argument to be made here. Please, someone join this conversation with information that might help flesh out the other side, but I just don't see it. I really want to know why someone would support this outside of just my team's winning, so tiger blood. I, I don't get it. Nothing about this points to good business practices. <sighs> okay, let me cover one more story, then we'll go into... Um, uh, this is this is a pair of stories coming out of uh, Slash Gear. Uh, the, the top headlines that have come, and you'll pardon some of the... Uh, some of the shaky moments that I've had, I've been trying to scan headlines for, um, here, let me, uh, let me cue this up and get that there. So these are uh, two stories out of, out of Slash Gear. Um, I'm a huge fan of Mr. Chris Davies. He is a super sexy British dude who writes uh, real, real good stuff. So you should definitely seek him out on Twitter and tell him that I said he is flipping adorable. Uh, this is coming out of uh, um, the Microsoft news uh, from today. Again, uh, Microsoft is going to have a whole series of, of announcements today. I'm just super early in the podcast to be unraveling all of this. But um, uh, Microsoft AI for accessibility is a $25 million fund for smart disability tech. Uh, Microsoft is launching AI for Accessibility, a $25 million program to fund ways to leverage artificial intelligence to benefit those with disabilities. Announced at Build 2018 today, the five-year scheme will fund and support projects that use AI to alleviate the impact of being blind, deaf, and more. This is super exciting. We, we got into some conversations, too, when we did the geek debate between TK and uh, um, Josh Vergara. One of the things that I thought was one of the most interesting questions that was asked during the, the viewer Q&A was talking about um, accessibility issues. If you have phones that all sort of have random swipe gestures on flat glass surfaces, how do you properly support communities of people that might have specific needs, you don't want to leave those people out of the loop. And when we build computing platforms 
that are as accessible for those individuals as everyone else, that actually improves the state of development, the state of interactivity, and the intuitiveness of smartphone design, of gadget design, of electronics design for everybody. So imagine if we could build a, like a true proper AI accessibility assistant that really helps you navigate all of the services on your phone, can tie together all of the information in your various cloud and social networking accounts, and can deliver meaningful interaction on that. That's not just a boon for someone who might be sight impaired or hearing impaired or, or not have the ability to operate a phone with their, you know, their, their primate, evolved primate digits. That helps everybody. I would be interested in turning those features on, especially like when I've got to do stuff and I'm driving a car and I, I, pieces of information are sort of popping up on my smartwatch. But, you know, again, I'm really trying to focus on operating a mo uh, moving vehicle, a motor vehicle. That could be an incredible an incredible boon for um for for that type of uh strategy for for that type of manufacturing so that could be epic and again i i keep getting excited and disappointed by the potential microsoft has in the space but this is one area where microsoft could very well be ahead of the curve significantly the satya nadella the uh the head of microsoft right now is so focused on server side strategies and uh, data and cloud services that this could be a huge step for microsoft that they would have the tools the infrastructure and the implementation to really work on windows as a service as opposed to making all operating systems these little buckets of information that you have to interact with solo of having a true cloud like your information literally just follows you to whatever display you want to put it on or interact with it with whatever headphones you might want to use or any type of uh, control surface. And if they can improve Cortana as the, the front-facing interface for that, that could, be, that could be pretty epic. To go along with that, this is the other story that I thought was just kind of cool from a developer standpoint. Uh, this is... Uh, again, from Mr. Chris Davies at Slash Gear, Project Connect for Azure is Microsoft's AI sensor gift to devs. Connect is back, and it wants to make the Internet of Things smarter and less reliant on the cloud. Microsoft has taken the wraps off Project Connect for Azure today at Builds 2018. And if you thought uses for the fiendishly clever depth sensing camera began and ended with Xbox gaming, think again. This is a whole article talking about what the future imp implementation for Connect might be. Again, Microsoft, well ahead of the curve on having some sort of smart voice control in the living room. Uh, creeped people out that they had cameras that could track you moving around in space and microphones that were always listening to you. Oh my God, they're going to hear everything. And then consumers went nuts on Amazon Echoes. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's fine. I'm totally cool with Amazon uh, leveraging all of my behavioral information to sell me more products. Uh, but Microsoft is the scary player here. No, they were just first. And I, and I get it. I understand. Um, that's kind of a bummer. Uh, but, you know, getting back into it, there are so many uh, opportunities and there are so many situations where I look at things like HoloLens and... I want to see that push. I want to see that more aggressive push. Microsoft makes me really excited for something. And then they kind of just peter out. You know, uh, HoloLens could be this amazing platform for consumers, but we're only seeing them really approach uh, businesses, corporate infrastructure, stuff like that. I, I really wish, you know, again, why not just do it? sports metaphor touchdown whole nine yards i don't know something um yeah so i don't know but anyway there's going to be a whole bunch of of information coming out from build um windows uh windows 10 playing better with uh iphones and android for your notifications and alerts um and i think i've even seen some other news about some of their future ai and uh edge uh, incorporating smarter assistant features into web browsers. So some cool stuff could, could happen there too. Uh, Edge is actually not a terrible uh, browser. Uh, I've been using it at uh, Newegg because uh, like we, we might have a, a manufacturer's laptop on the table and it's not like I took the time to fully set it up and install a whole bunch of stuff. It's really just like I need a browser. So I'll throw on, just because Edge is there, I'll use it and it doesn't suck. Um, you know, Internet Explorer is, was terrible. Edge, not bad. I still prefer Firefox, but um, yeah, it could be uh, could be some nice steps in the right direction. It's just more, 
I really wish we could see Microsoft iterating more aggressively on the consumer facing side of all of this uh, equipment. So I'm gonna take a quick sip of coffee here and uh, I have a couple Q and A issues, but if there are any questions coming in uh, that you wanna talk about specifically, I am at an hour 45, so doing better than talking about the news in two hours. Ha ha. Um, so uh, let me see, from Fat Produce, all we would need at this point is Mag uh, Magil Barrett Roddenberry's voice for the next generation of accessibility interface. Yeah, it would be really nice if we could just sample her voice from all of uh, the Star Trek computer um, uh, computer uh, interactions and uh, create like a working profile of that. We could be pretty close, though, with some of the stuff that Adobe's been doing with voice modeling and voice scanning. It could be really scary coming up uh, what we can make people say that they didn't actually say. Uh, this is from Tech Leathercraft. Do cellular 4G providers fall under the current net neutrality regulations? Verizon, T-Mobile, under their cell service. So what's hilarious is the original OPO, the original open, OIO, sorry, the original open internet order, I believe, left off wireless infrastructure. And Verizon fought the original OIO, sued the FCC, won, and that's what prompted the FCC to consider wireless as part of this entire infrastructure. <clears throat> so uh, I would imagine that moving forward, especially as mobile first has become this huge institution, uh, more people interact with data and services through their phone first, rather through, than through their landline connections, uh, that, I, that new instances of net neutrality will affect the mobile infrastructure as well. There was another story I was going to add just talking about, I, I think it was Vice or Motherboard, I can't remember who, uh, just talking about all of the bullshit marketing that's happening with 5G coming down the pipe and that it's not really going to be this revolutionary thing. Um, I might include a link to that too, but uh, yeah, we're going to be seeing that play pretty heavy too because we're ginning up a lot of controversy like, ooh, China's this big boogeyman and we're going to lose our footing in 5G when 5G isn't really anything more than gigabit LTE refined and most of the United States isn't even going to be getting gigabit LTE. So we're going to be getting these faux 5G little pop-ups on our phones, just like we used to get 4G from carriers when it was really just, you know, high-speed GSM. You know, it was like a, just a HSPA. Ooh, HSPA plus, it's 4G. You're like, no, that's not the real true spec for LTE. So a lot of this stuff is just going to be crap branding exercises. This is from LGH. Oh, what about positive things? Uh, oh, I think we're talking about net neutrality. What about positive things? Suppose a Spotify makes a deal for unlimited use for $1. Here in the Never Netherlands, a provider had to stop offering this because of net neutrality laws. I'm not saying that everything's going to be hunky-dory, but what we're talking about is why should Spotify get some kind of preferred relationship with potential customers? Why, why should Spotify get special preferential treatment over iTunes, over Google Play, over Pandora, over Tidal? Why, why should that be okay? And why should you be able to, to split that up and allow one company preferential treatment on your network? The flip side of that is you are now also punishing every other consumer who chooses not to do business with Spotify. So they don't get any special consideration for their music listening. This is exactly why I was not a fan of T-Mobile's binge on plans. Because then T-Mobile gets to be the outlet that picks the winners and losers. You as a consumer will now have to choose between supporting the service you like or saving a little bit of money by switching to a, server, uh, a service that T-Mobile has offered preferential treatment to. And it wasn't a one-to-one -one process to say like, oh, well, you're supporting Spotify, Pandora, and Google Play. What about iTunes, Tidal, and you know, Stitcher? You know, like, what about those services? Oh, well, we don't support those on Binge On yet. Well, that's going to count against my data. I guess I'm not going to use those services on my phone now. So you, you are making the market lopsided and making it lopsided through a very anti-consumer and anti-competition business practice. In the long run, if we can improve competition, then those types of shenanigans will not be necessary and the regulation to police those shenanigans will not be necessary. So it's a win-win. Again, 
if we take our lumps now and we tear off the Band-Aid and just accept net neutrality as being a way to protect consumer interests, we will establish what the future of commerce will be, and then we can actually invest in doing business that way. If we keep playing this pendulum swing game, we're going to have all of these holes in the market as one administration does this, and another administration walks everything back and, and tries to unravel it, and then the next administration tries to enact it all again. In those transition points, corporations will have huge influence over what the next phase of that's going to be. And that's why we as consumers need to say, this needs to be enshrined as an institution so that we can monitor it, we can have oversight over it, and we can protect it. Then from there, we can actually create the next generation of products and services and know how to do business between consumers and corporations. Right now, we don't have that. We don't have that, um, we don't have that safety. Uh... So from also from LGH replying, I agree with the ban of the Spotify service for the very reason you mentioned. However, the government will say we will manage this and it's hard to argue against it. But what what we can't just say the government. What are we saying? Are we saying the government is going to police products and services? Because that's not what the United States net neutrality is trying to enact. United States net neutrality policy, Title II regulation of the Internet has nothing to do with touching any services currently available on the internet or any services which might be available on the internet. It is the classification of the internet, the difference between an information uh, service or a technology service or a distribution service. So that the government isn't this one thing. The government is a humongous collection of tiny little organizations that all have varying degrees of power. And the FCC is one tiny, underfunded, little regulatory agency within the greater confines of the Internet. Net neutrality will not step on any of the products or services available. Net neutrality will dictate to ISPs how they can do business with their customers in getting them onto the internet. It's basically regulating the on-ramps to the information superhighway. Uh, whatever you do on the information superhighway is your jam. If you want to have crazy stuff on that internet, you go have crazy stuff on that internet. That's, that's it. That's all it is. So trying to enact like the government is this big boogeyman that's going to start having in, having input as to what services are on the internet isn't the purview of net neutrality, Title II regulation of the internet. Other bills and other laws might come forward, especially from a conservative Senate. I mean, they might have an interest in saying what companies get to do business on the internet and what companies don't, but that's not what Title II regulation will give the FCC the power to enact. That will have to come from further regulation or further legislation, not what we're currently trying to protect. And that's a very important distinction because that's another part of the misinformation campaign, is saying that somehow Title II is going to prevent competition. But it's not. <laughs> like, it, it only serves to make sure that ISPs can't tell you, the consumer, what products and services you should have access to. That's it. That's all it is. Now, I don't know what the EU has enacted, and I don't know what the UK has enacted, and I don't know what, how that's different in Europe. But when we're talking about Title II in the United States and what California and, and New York are trying to write into state bills, that's it. Can you get on the Internet for a fair price? Can you get on the Internet and not have your speeds throttled? Can you get on the Internet and use any service on the Internet for free or, or for, for the price that you pay to get on the internet and not have the ISP dictate what services get preferential treatment. There we go. That's, that's all there is. From Mohammed, uh, luckily we have unlimited data plans so I can binge without having to worry, but we need to have safeguards against our data. So, it, you know, if we're talking about consumer competition, when T-Mobile started doing binge on, we hadn't fully enacted net neutrality. Once net neutrality was 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 assured by the FCC having this regulatory agency over over the internet what did we see we saw T-Mobile Sprint AT&T and Verizon start offering 
unlimited data plans with soft caps somewhere around 20 gigabytes of streaming per month. We would not have had those if we hadn't had net neutrality because every carrier was looking at doing some kind of sponsored data plan. AT&T had a gimmick where you know, a company could pay AT&T more to take their service off of your data plan. So let's say you had a uh, four gigabytes per month of data, which is the dumbest thing ever, is that you have a bucket of data. Um, if you had four gigabytes of data and you wanted to use Dropbox on your phone, Dropbox could pay AT&T more so that Dropbox interactions did, did not count against your four gigabyte data plan. So again, it would be AT&T taking money from services to then try and alter consumer behavior as to what services were kosher on their network. And, and this is also what Ben John was from T-Mobile was, we're going to make all of these music streaming services and all of these video streaming services free of data caps for our users. But anyone who's using a competing service, well, that's going to count against your data. So again... That's, that's a very unhealthy way to promote competition. In fact, that's the opposite. That's a very good way to prevent competition from happening on your networks. So um, I think that's enough. We could probably start wrapping this up, unless you guys have any other burning questions out there, but we are getting to that two-hour mark. I really wanted to end this sooner than two hours, but like I said, we had a lot to talk about, and whenever I start getting stompy and political, then I start getting stompy and political. So um, some, some housekeeping stuff coming up. Later tonight, I will be publishing the my review on the mic, me. Uh, this is a $400 studio-grade large diaphragm condenser microphone in a rugged shock mount housing for mobile production, vlogging, uh, video production, podcasting, you name it. Uh, so some major questions at play as to whether or not um, uh, whether or not this kind of investment is really going to be the the killer kit you need to produce better audio when you're on the go, especially for the price point, because uh, some some interesting pros and cons, especially with a market that's heating up finally for high quality audio. I I've been super excited about this space lately. I've been way less excited about phones than I have been about accessories and things that help us get our work done. Ultra cheap gimbals showing up for smartphones to smooth out video production. Um, modular and wireless audio accessories that give us significantly better capabilities for producing high quality video and audio when on the go. And uh, last week on Newegg Now, please go check it out. We have a, a, a segment, an interview with a uh, one of the PR reps over at Creative, uh, you know, they make Sound Blaster sound cards. And one of their new products is looking really exciting. And I nerded out on this guy so hard that they did actually hook me up with their new USB audio interface. This is the Sound Blaster K3 Plus. And so this was actually built on a line of products that Creative has over in Asia for karaoke systems. <laughs> so it has silly things in here. Like it's got um, auto-tune, um, auto-tune reverb, built-in delays. It's all hardware-based. So you can plug this directly into a streaming solution and, and not have to worry about software plugins, which might, uh, that, that, that might take up CPU power on your system. But one of the cool things, and, you know, again, XLR connectors, phantom power, uh, you can power professional grade microphones off of something like this. But one of the things that's critically exciting to me is that they were able to do that with gain stages that are all powered through a normal USB connector. So it's not that you need some kind of power brick to plug this into. Like my current audio interface is a slightly nicer interface, but it really does need um, a, a wall wart uh, power brick to, to fully power it. This can be powered off of a portable USB battery pack and they built into it a four pin connector so that you can hook it up directly to a phone. So you wanna take this out on the go, you can have really professional mixing and leveling and it's got a soundboard so you can have applause and an intro and gunshots and a baby crying and auto-tune if you need auto-tune during your podcast interviews, but you can run this all from a phone. You can plug it directly into a phone, control all of your audio and hardware, and have it come out. So I'm going to be doing a full review on this kit as I have a little bit more time to play with it. But again, 
ridiculously exciting accessory stuff for really maximizing our ability to create content out in the field and really produce high quality production from a number of different devices. I'm also gonna be doing a quick review and I don't have it right here. Um, Insta360 sent me over their, uh, their one uh, 360 degree camera and it's a, it's a very interesting piece of kit to use not only because I'm still trying to find ways to incorporate 360 video into my various productions. Like I really wanna be doing more 360, but it's got some really cool tools built into it for um, editing video, even for content that's not 360. So their app does some really cool things with like, you just hold it up and you shoot in 360 and it's got decent image stabilization too, which is pretty exciting. But then when you get that video, you can turn it into an HD video and pick points where the video will pan to things that you want to show. So it's kind of like you having a camera team and being able to show off things in your environment in a regular rectangle 16 by 9 video in HD. So it, it, it's kind of tricky to, to explain. I'm going to be having a I'm going to be showing a video on it uh, soon so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. But that could be a pretty killer app for 360 cameras not necessarily always trying to produce spherical video, but if you're a producer of one, if you're a solo producer, often like I am, bam, you just set that up on like a little tripod or on some kind of stand, you record everything that you wanna do, and then in post, you point the camera where you want it to go after the fact. And that could be really, really, really cool. From LGH on the, uh, the K3, test the auto-tune by singing for us, then Muhammad, yes, we need the singing. <laughs> I don't have to find a song that that's not horribly racist, but is also like copyright free or public domain or something like that. Um, my, my daughter was singing shoe fly. Don't bother me. And my wife and I have that kind of cringe face is like, Oh, that's an old slave song. Uh, she's two and a half. She probably doesn't need to know about that just yet. Oh, okay. We're really sensitive liberals, <laughs> really guilty liberals. Um, but folks, that's going to do it for me. A bunch of stuff is coming up on the channel. A bunch of stuff is, is heading to Newegg uh, very, very soon, especially next month as we're getting into E3 and Computex. I'm going to be super busy wrapping all that stuff up too. And uh, definitely help me out. Check out some of that audio kit. Um, because this has taken me back to my roots back when I used to review mics for voiceover and re home recording uh, write-ups. Uh, this is really exciting because it's like taking me out of the studio and uh, the Mic Me video will be up later tonight. You can check that out. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching, for participating. I saw a, a ton of conversation in the live chat. I really appreciate you guys sticking with me through this podcasting experiment. Uh, once again, I'm going to plug the Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. That's where my future camera and audio reviews uh, for head uh, for smartphone audio, not all audio, all videos will be public except for the camera and headphone jack deep dive. What used to be called the real camera review and the real audio review on pocket. Now that's all going to be, on the Patreon, that's gonna be Patreon exclusive for subscribers. And we're really close to unlocking credits and uh, starting up a, a an ad-free version of of the uh, of all of my podcasting. So for the interviews that are coming up, the conversations that are coming up, and just these Monday morning tech chats, if you want them without ads on the uh, the RSS feed, the Patreon is going to be the place to to do that. Uh, again, uh, for thanking all the people in the conversation, you can hit me up on emails, hit me up on social media at some gadget guy on Instagram and Twitter. I don't really spend any time on Facebook because Facebook is the devil and I hate it. But uh, you know where you can catch me uh, next week as we uh, jump into another tech week. Get your tech week started off right on another Monday morning podcast. And uh, I hope to see you there. And uh, yeah. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you all next week. Be well.